So we're going to start out today and go over the quiz um, from last week. Um, this is the first time I've done one of these, so I uh, thought it went pretty well. Um, first question is, an analog voltage is in the range of 0 to 3.1 volts if it can be measured with an accuracy of plus or minus 100 millivolts. At most, how many bits does it convey? Anyone know? Yes. Five bits. Yeah, because um, you, you can measure a zero, you can measure 100 millivolt, 200 millivolt, 300 millivolt um, in, in point 0.1 increments. So uh, you could represent a value from zero to 31 this way. Everyone see that? And then log base two of, 30, of um, 32, which it's zero to 31, so there's 32 values. So log base two of 32 is five bits. Um, Next question is, what is the range of values that is representable within a 9-bit twos complement signed number? Um, so for this one, I, I generally, if it's, if it's twos complement, I just take one bit away. So I, th I think of it like an 8-bit number. And then um, the maximum positive number you could do with an 8-bit number is 2 to the 8th minus 1 which is 256 minus 1, 255. And then with 2's complement, you can go negative to 2 to the nth, right? Which would be, well, well in this case, 2 to the n minus 1, two to the, negative 2 to the 8th, which is negative 256 to 255. You guys with me? Did you guys cover floating point in 212? So IEEE 754 floating point uses a different... Um, a different way to represent signed exponents where they use this bias notation where the range is slightly different from two's complement. You guys remember that? So if you have an 8-bit exponent field in a, in a floating point, it's like negative 255 to positive 256, a little bit different. Um, that always confuses me. But no, regular two's complement, you can go you have wider range on the negative side. So that's how you could think of it. Okay. Any questions about this? All right. Um, next question. I like this one. Flying saucer crashes in a Nebraska cornfield. The FBI investigates the wreckage, finds the engineering manual, contains the equation in an alien number, numbering system 325 plus 42 equals 411. If this equation is correct, how many fingers would you expect the aliens to have? This one uh, implies that the reason why we have a base 10 system is because we have 10 fingers, right? So hopefully you, 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 uh, you caught that. Um, so how many fingers do the aliens have? Um, this one's kind of tricky. The way I did it was I just looked at 5 plus 2, which is 7, and I looked at the result, the least significant digit is 1. So if the result was 7 and the least significant digit is 1, it must be a base 6 system because what, if you had a number in the least significant digit that was a 6, it would be a 0, and a 7 would put it, put it as a 1. You guys with me? Make sense? So that, that's how I thought of it. Um, Charles brute forced this with a, with a, with a Python script <laughs> uh, and, and tried because in Python you can actually... Um, do arithmetic in an arbitrary base, which is really neat. Okay, um, this one I had several questions on, and so uh, first of all, it, it, the question's a little janky because it says, is it possible to assign logic levels so that a device with the transfer characteristics shown below would serve as an inverter? Well, you can't really answer that question, <laughs> so I guess the assumption there is it can, right? And then it says, if so, what is the noise margin on the low side? <clears throat> so um, in order to solve this, you need to figure out what the high and low levels are on the output and what the high and low levels are for the input. Okay? So it's a little confusing because of the way this, this plot is set up. But if you, look at, um, if you look at V out, you can see that it looks like um, four volts and above is representing a logic one. 
right? Now, it looks strange because this, this, this thing sort of slopes downward because it's an inverter. So when V in is low, you're going to have a high V out, right? That's why they said it's, it's an, an inverter. So the, um, the V out high is going to be 4 volts. Likewise, the V out low is going to be about, what, 1.5, I guess, here, right? You guys with me? Yeah. Right. Now, um, V in, it looks like V in can go all the way up to about two and a half before you get into this sort of gain region, right? Unity gain region. You guys with me? So if you look at, you know, you have to look at the, so what I'm trying to say is, you look at the vertical axis for the output voltage, you look at the horizontal axis for the input voltage. So the input voltage can get up to, it looks like anything below two and a half is gonna be a, is gonna be a low for the input. So that's V input low, V I H. And then likewise, once you get to three, is that right, about three? then that's, that looks like it's, it's going to be a high, V-I-H, input high. So input low is 2.5, input high is 3, right? That's pretty good. I mean, you know, as long as you're below 2.5, that's going to be registered as a zero or a false. If you go above 3 and above, that's registered as a high, right? So then if you look at the difference between V-O-H and V-I-H, you get the noise margin. So the difference, the, 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 what you're looking at is, um, uh, da, 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 da. yeah. So the V output low is going to be, looks like what, one and a half here, right? Looking at the vertical axis, is that right? You guys with me? About one and a half. Um, and then for the, that's the output. And then the input, um, what do we say, three? Two and a half? Two and a half. Two and a half. Sorry, oh, sorry, two and a half. Yeah, you look at this point here down. Yeah, two and a half. Right. You guys with me? Two and a half. So, in other words, horizontal axis, you get to two and a half, and that's where you lose the, the nice output there, the nice conditioned output value, right? So, two and a half and three and a half, right? So, three and a half minus two and a half. Make sense? I get that right? Wait. Oh, no, sorry. I'm looking at high. See this one. So let's not let me let me step back here a second. We're looking at low here, right? It's asking for the noise margin low, right? So a low input voltage is anything below two and a half, right? Because that's where it spikes down. Right. Okay. A low output voltage um, is one and a half, right? So two and a half minus one and a half, right? So the noise margin is one volt, right? One. Now, when I first set up this question, um, I screwed up the way I set up this question. And originally, I marked two volts as the correct answer, which I think caused some confusion. Yeah. So I went back, and I think this was like Friday morning, Friday afternoon. I changed it so if you answered one or two volts, it, it should be marked as correct. And that should be applied retroactively. So even if you submitted this quiz, I think this is the way it works. Well, well if, if you notice that this is not the case, please let me know. But as I understand it, if you submitted the quiz before I made this change, hopefully it'll retroactively uh, apply this, this change. So if you answered either one volt or two volts, it's correct. The only wrong answer is three volts. Everyone with me? OK. Any questions about that? See, the confusing part of this question is, is that it's an inverter. So when you look at the, when you're trying to figure out the output low, you're on this side, right? Right? And the input low, you're on this side, right? That's the part that's hard about this. Any questions? Yes. Like 
<laughs> yeah, the, the key to this is this region here, is this sloping region in the middle. First of all, you, you know that the high and low are the ones, you know, anything low is close to zero, anything high is supposed to be close to VDD, which in this case, it's not explicitly stated, but it's, it's implied that VDD is 5 volts, right? So you know that, but, and, and you also are going to expect that there's going to be something in the middle that's kind of like what they call the uh, forbidden zone in the book. It's kind of this um, region in the middle where the gate is not really a gate, it's more like sort of like an amplifier almost, except the problem is, is that in CMOS, if you're in this forbidden zone, you've got the pull up and the pull down network are sort of both quasi on, so you're gonna be drawing a lot of static current. It's not a good, you don't wanna be in that forbidden zone. It's, it's not efficient, right? Um, and it can, you know, it leads to these errors, so bit errors, right? So, in order, so to answer your question, you're looking for a part in the middle that's, you're looking for the forbidden zone for both the input and the output, right? So in this case, you've got this weird, you got this weird inflection point here, and I think they did that, I got this from the book, I think they did that to confuse you, because in the book, um, they didn't have this inflection point. In fact, it was kind of a more of a curve that they showed in the book, because it was, they were trying to show an actual, what an actual gate does, an actual real, real life hardware. This is totally made up. There's no hardware that behaves this way. But, um, but the idea is, is that you know, you've got you know, V out is five here and then it's four here. And I guess you, know, you assume, well, five, four, that's close enough to one, right? That's those, both, those are both one, right? So even if you're between this region, five, four volts and five volts, that's still fine. That's gonna be good enough, right? That's, that's a one. But you wanna avoid this part that sort of is in this transitionary part here, right? Does that make sense? So, so in order to, so I think the, the best way to do this is to, the, the methodology is you have to find input high, input low, output high, output low, right? That's, you need to find those four values and then you can find the noise, noise margin. Actually, in this case, you only needed to find input low and output low, right? So what's an output low? An output low in this case is, um, you know, you look at the, the vertical axis, that's one and a half. Input low is two and a half, right? You look at the horizontal axis. Axis. Does that make sense? Why did you start two and a half? Two and a half was, um, I don't even know if two and a half, I think that's about, it looks like about, it looks like right, looks like it's right, right? It's when this thing starts going into this undefined region, right? The output. It's when the output is like, confused, like I don't know if I'm true or false. It starts this downward slope. And so if you line that up to the horizontal axis, it's two and a half, or about two and a half. So it's right here. Okay. Um, all right, last question. Um, this one was a, um, I believe this is a, uh, an AOI gate. So um, if you look at A, B, and C are your inputs, Y is your output. Now you might say, well, how do you know that? Well, because A, B, and C are connected to the gates of the transistors, that's in the middle terminal, and Y is connected to drains, which is the top on the NMOS and bottom on the PMOS. All right, that's how you know what's an input and an output. Gates are inputs, drains are outputs. Okay, um, this line, this is, this is VDD, it's not marked, but this is VDD at the top, and this is ground at the bottom. So you have a pull down network and you have a pull up network, and the pull down and pull up are complementary. So anything that's in parallel on the pull down is in series on the pull up. Anything that's in series on the pull down is in parallel on the pull up. Right? Say that right? <laughs> a and B are in series. A and B are in parallel. And then A and B being series or parallel, in this case being series here are in parallel with C. And then A and B are in series with C here. So it's kind of like a nested structure sort of when you think about it. A and B are together and then sort of A and B sort of have like, think of it like they have parentheses around them, right? So A and B, parentheses, or C, 
So A and B are in, because they're anded, they're in series, and C is in parallel, so it's ORD, right? But it's CMOS, so this is the pull down network. So I gave you this same example in the last class, but I, I screwed it up because it turns out that um, I forgot about this. You only care when you're doing these, when you're building these CMOS gates, you only care about, um, you're looking for parts of the truth table that are, give a zero output, right, for the pull down network, right? So the way I always do it is I build the pull down network first and, I put, and then I build the pull up network as a sort of a mirror complement of the pull down network. You guys with me? And you, when you may say, why do you do that? Well, it's because the pull down network uses NMOSs, which turn on with a one. Okay? So what that means, if, if you look at the truth table here, so I'm just going to, one, one, one. All right, so here's all eight possible input combinations. Okay, so if A and B are both one, so all the rows of the truth table where A and B are both one, it's going to turn both of these guys on, and it's going to create a path from Y to ground. It's going to pull Y down to ground. It's going to short the output with ground, so it's going to put out a zero. Make sense? So all the rows where A and B are one, which there's only two, right? These last two, that's going to give me a zero output because it's going to pull down. Likewise, any row where C is one, regardless of A and B, where C is one, it only takes C being one to pull it down because that's in parallel, right? So if all the ones where C is one and there's you know, there's four of those. That's going to be a pull down, pull down, pull down. Right? And then anything else is going to be a pull up. Right? So one, one, one. Guys with me? Make sense? Okay. So then this, this question is pretty easy then because zero, one, zero would be 0, 1, 0, you know, obviously the answer should be 1, right? You just, once you build the truth table, you just look up the answer in the truth table. Now, when I, I gave you a similar example last class, and in that example, um, I actually, I built the pull down network, but I also included the zeros in the truth table. You don't have to do that. So I want to correct myself there. You only have to build the pull down network using the, the, you find all the rows that are zero output and then you match, you just find the ones that those correspond. Because NMOS turns on with a one and it's used, and it's implemented the pull down network. So because the, the pull down network represent the rows of the truth table that output zero, for each one of those you find the ones. For each one of those rows you find the ones. So in this case, I'm looking for C being a one. So that's where you get this. And in these, in these guys, you know, so C1, 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 these two guys I have A, B are ones. So that's why A and B are in, in series here. Does that make sense? Well, I was going to say, since the output is zero more times than one, wouldn't you think it's zero or? Since the output is, yeah, because there's five rows with a zero output and three rows with a one output. Yeah. yeah. For this one, zero, one, zero? Yeah. Zero. Oh, so it's only if that's okay. Zero, one, zero is a one. Yeah, because what's happening there is with zero, one, zero, A is off, so you can't go through this path. You're, you're shut down here, right? And then if C is zero, you're shut down from this path. So you can't go either way. You can't, there's no. You can't go, yeah, exactly. That's a good way to say it. You can't go through the transistor if the gate is zero. If for an NMOS. Of course, with a PMOS, it's the opposite. But see, again, I, I'm, I just look at this like I build the pull down network first. I mean, you could do the same thing. You could think of this in reverse and look for all of the 
All, the other way to do this, by the way, is if you look at all the rows in the truth table that are 1, right, and you find the zeros. So in this case, where it's 1, you've got a 0, 0, 0. Here it's a 0, 1, 0. So in this case, um, you, C, let's see, a, it's, it's C and, so in order for it to be a, in order for you to have a 1 here, C has to be a 0. Right? That's one condition. I'm sorry? I was just saying, like, why? Because so, like, that C would output a 1, so then the 0 is knotted, and then it, everything below will be closed. Yeah, if C is, well, if C is a 0, you're going to close this. You're going you're gonna to make this connection here, right? If C is a 1, then this guy gets turned off, and there's no way you can pull this up, right? So C has to be a 0. But it's not only that. It's not only that, because not only does C have to be a 0, but either A or B have to be a 0 in addition to that. So in this case, you've got. Right. So if, if C is a 0 and A or B are both 1s, see, it's not good enough. Because even though you'll have this guy on, these guys will both be off. Right. So by, by the way, though, this is a good explanation as to why you have to do negative logic in CMOS. Because check this out. Let's say we just want to do an AND gate. AND, right? So we got, look at a truth table for an AND gate. So there's your AND gate right there. So if I was going to build an AND gate, I'd have to look for all of the rows where I pull down right, to 0. Uh, wait, is that right? All the I'm sorry, yeah. All the, rule, all the rows where I uh, pull down to 0, which would be these three guys, right? And I would have to build a pull down network based on that, right? Uh, and I'm looking for where the ones are, but there's, there's a contradiction there, right? I can't, I can't build a pull down network that'll implement this. Tomorrow. Oh. Okay. Yeah, I think everyone expected that. <laughs> okay. Um, so, yeah. So, um, uh, right. So, yeah. You can't you can't build a pull down network for um, uh, an AND gate. Right. Um, OK, any questions? Yes? Uh, so a CMOS and an MMOS, um, is that just because one's in parallel and one's in series? No, they don't have to. Either one can be in parallel or series. The, the question is, um, the, the NMOSs are what's responsible for setting the output of the gate to 0, right? And they're the ones that are turned on with a 1. You with me? So, so what you have to do is, whenever you're building your pull down network, you have to um, you have to look at where you, you have to find your ones. You with me? So in this case, um, I've got a uh, B can be a one, <laughs> right? And I'll pull down, but it's got to be B and not A or A and not B, or not A and not B, there's no way to, um, actually, the real reason is, is I think that this, this, this row is the problematic row, right? This is a simpler way to look at it. If you look at this first row, you have a pull down, you got to pull it down, but you don't have any ones in this row for the inputs. Does that make sense? That's the problem. I mean, likewise, if you have an or, so if this is A and B, a or B has the same problem because uh, this would be, it has the same problem. If you look at this pull down, this zero row, 
I don't have any ones to go off of. I don't have any ones to key off of. That's the easier way to look at it. You guys with me? I don't have any ones. I don't have any ones in this row where it outputs zero in order to build my pull down network. In other words, in other words, there's no way to have a path where it pulls down where I'm turning on n mosses because there's no n mosses I can turn on because all my inputs are zero for those zero output rows. Does that make sense? That's a I think that's a easy easy way to 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 explain it. Okay. Um, is there another question, or that was it? Right. Oh, that was it. Okay. That was the quiz. Any other questions about the quiz? Yes. The first question. That's right, yeah. Um, so th this, uh, from zero, um, let's see, it's 0.1 volts, right? So, so one way to look at this is to take zero divided by 0.1. You know, your lower end of the range here would just be zero, right? Because you can represent zero, because zero is a multiple of 0.1. And then 3.1 would be, would be 31 ticks from, of that 0.1, right? So it's, you, you're, you're, it's like a value between 0 and 31. And so you, the, the tricky part is that you have to include 0 in that range because 0 would be a representable value here, right? So, so you have 32 unique values from 0 to 31. And so you're, taking, you're right, you take the log base 2 of 32, which is 5. That's where you get the five bits. That makes sense? I get Right. So if you had, it's like, it's a, you know, zero to thirty-one with an increment of one, or zero to three point one with an increment of point one is, you know, there, there, there's still thirty-two unique values there. And then you take the log base two of thirty-two. Yes. I just want to let you know for uh, question four. Yes. I think it uh, so you answered. You answered. I put one volt and it's still zero to the okay. Okay. Good. We'll fi Charles. We'll fix it. Can you send me an email about that? Yeah. yeah this is the first time. I apologize. The reason I made the first quiz so short is because I expected there would be something come up. This is the first time I've done these. So we'll, we'll go in and fix that. We'll fix it for you. Or fix it. Yeah, that was, again, I apologize. I just screwed up the way I, I set that one up. All right. Um, all right, so quickly uh, reviewing from last time, we've got uh, um, logic circuit has a functional spec and a timing spec. Um, the, and then you've got inputs and outputs. The, what is the functional spe specification? That's sometimes called the behavior. And you can express a circuit's behavior in a number of ways. If it's a combinational circuit, it's you know truth table, Boolean algebra. Um, how else? I guess arithmetic, maybe? You could. So functional spec is how it works, and timing spec is how long it takes. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and timing spec is you know, anything related to the timing. Um, so there's combinational logic and sequential logic. Um, one of my things that I want to make, sh make sure I, well, next chapter is sequential logic. And part of the reason I, I started here from the beginning uh, in this class from the beginning of the book is I wanted to make sure that I cover I was able to cover sequential logic well because I don't think they they get much of a chance to cover that in, in 211 but sequential logic is when you have a, a clock so in and, and you guys you guys know that you know anytime you go and buy a processor or talk about processors or GPUs the notion of a clock speed always comes up right inevitably it's, it's a very it's sort of um, you know comes up quite a bit in hardware talk, right? Clock speed, gigahertz, that kind of stuff. Um, and so 
um, the, what the clock does is it allows, it is what enables digital logic circuits to have memory, to, to, to retain information over time um, in, a way, in a way that you can um, uh, implement it as part of the behavior, right? You guys with me? So even a sequential logic has some memory because there's a charge that moves through it. But sequential logic adds a clock and allows you to, to retain data across clock cycles. And then that clock can, can you know, run at whatever frequency you want it to run at. You guys with me? OK. So combinational logic and sequential logic. Combinational logic, every output is a function of the inputs. Sequential logic is function of inputs and the input history, right? or the, you know, what happened uh, in the previous cycles. Um, Okay, Boolean, let's see. So we talked about how behavior or function can be specified as Boolean equations. Uh, there's a few terminology things. Complement is, and this is something I always screw up. I always call this inverting instead of complementing. But if you have a variable as part of a Boolean equation and you put a bar over it, you're taking the complement. Um, but like I said, I always say you're inverting it. But either way, it's the same thing. You're you're, you're saying that that expression is whatever was in that variable, you're going to flip it. You know, if, it's, if it's true, you, it's like an inverter. If it's true, it'll be false. If it's false, it'll be true. Um, literal is a variable or its complement. Now, notice literals, by the way. When you do CMOS logic, um, you generally when you design a gate, when you design one gate, you assume that whatever comes into that gate is just a variable, right? Because if you, if you need to provide a complement form to it, then you'd have to add an inverter to it. You guys with me? Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Uh, implicate is a product of literals. A min term is also a product of literals. So what's the difference? What, what's, why do you have implicate and min term? Why, why the redundancy? Min term is just when you have all the input variables. All, what, what do you mean all? all? All the ones that we care about for this behavior. Make sense? It's a min term. Also, it, it's, it's a product, or it's an implicant. It's an implicant, that's a, it's a full implicate, min term. Uh, max term is, uh, Kind of the same idea, except instead of a product, it's a sum of literals. OK, um, so there's sum of products form, which is when you, when you express a Boolean logic expression in terms of min, min terms. I almost said implicates, min terms. Meaning that it is a it is in a canonical form is a sum of products. What do you mean sum? Sum meaning ors, and products meaning ands, right? Um, what's so special about sum of products? Well, uh, nothing really. It just it, it's a canonical form, and you can express any boolean function in that form. Make sense? That doesn't mean it's efficient. It may have, it may be more complicated than it needs to be. You may be able to reduce it using a Carnot uh, map or a, using Boolean logic theorems to reduce it down into something simpler or change its form. You can change it to an equivalent form that's not in sum of products form, but it does the same thing as the sum of products form. You guys with me? So you can transform these things in different forms, but they do, but they implement the same Boolean function, or they would, you know, they would implement the same truth table. You guys with me? So um, this is something, by the way, when you do CAD design in EDA, you do like anytime you do any type of electronic design automation where you design a Boolean logic circuit and you run it through a compiler. It takes a long time because it has to go through these transformations to change 
uh, the circuit into other forms for whatever, because it's constrained. It has, like, in fact, I'm going to show you, I have, a, I have an example of that here in a minute. Um, I'll come back to that. Min term is when, is, is kind of the, con, the converse of the, I'm sorry, the sum of products is the converse, inverse of the product of sums. It works kind of the same way, except in min term notation, <clears throat> you look for, um, sorry, in sum of product, did I go back? Wait, now I got myself confused. Sum of products, yeah, sorry, we're still on sum of products. I thought we moved on to product of sums. Yeah, sum of products, you look, you look for, you look at the truth table, and if you look at all the rows where the output is true, um, then you can match up the inputs, and you can take the input values and convert them into these uh, min terms, right? So in this case, you've got two inputs, one output, and whenever you've got two, out, two rows where the output is true, and so those, that would be when A is false and B is true. So because that matches up to A being false and B is true, then the min term would be not A and B, right? So you can create, you can, you can infer a min term for each of these input combinations. Likewise, this, this other, uh, this other uh, row has a one where A is true and B is true, so the min term there is A and B. So you're gonna, when you, when you build you take this truth table and you build a Boolean logic expression to represent it, you have to include all the min terms. You have to go through and find all the rows where the output is one, build the min term, and then you join them all together with ors. Sum, sum them all up. You guys with me? So a min term is basically every term that has a one and it doesn't have a one on it? Yes, yeah, exactly. When, the inputs, that's right, yeah, okay. right? Um, now, the problem is, is that um, what happens if the truth table has more zero outputs than one outputs, then it would be more efficient if we had, it, had something there. We, 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 we went through and we looked at all the, we, we put a, um, we put a we put an ex, a sub expression for each of the rows that rep, that have a zero output. You guys with me? So if if you do that, that those are that's when you use max terms. So in this case, so in this case, um, this is the same truth table just repeated twice. In this one, we only have one row that gives a true output. So for that, we'll use the min terms. So in this case, the min term would be O and not C, right? And there's only one of them, so I don't have anything to sum. To, I don't have any other terms to sum together, right? On the other hand, I can build an equivalent function by looking at the rows with zeros, right? And do the same thing, um, except now the the... the the slide skips a step here, doesn't it? Yeah. So the slide is skipping a step here. So what you have to do, you have to start out with, um, you, you pretend as though you're doing the min term. So in this case, but instead of looking at the one output rows, you look at the zero output rows. So this first one is uh, not O, not O, right, and not C or not O and C, or O and C, right? Make sense? But then you have to realize that because those are the zero outputs, you need to, you need to put a complement over the whole thing. So in other words, this, this expression without the complement is, is giving us the zero row. So we want to complement the whole thing because we want to express this in terms of what makes this true. You guys with me? Make sense? So then, we'll, so, so then you, you apply De Morgan's law here. And um, you... 
um, go like this, where not O, C, not. Oops, sorry. Uh, yeah, that's right. O, C, not. So you guys remember De Morgan's Law? So De Morgan's Law is when, um, when you complement this entire expression, the ors become ands, right? And then you complement each of the individual parts, right? Yes? How come like, you're nodding them when you write a bar over them, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I mentioned that last time. That's another notation. It's the same thing. Okay. Um, like that? Or like it was like more like a little on the top or like a apostrophe. Tilde, there's different ways to do it. Yeah, or yeah, oh yeah, yeah, apostrophe. Yeah, you're right. That, that's what I was apostrophe, yep. Yeah. yeah. Just another notation. Okay. The book uses the notation with the uh, the bars. You know, there's like 10 different notations. Yeah. Everyone with me here? OK, then you apply De Morgan's Law again on each of these guys. So this becomes O or C, right? Because I, I complemented not O and not C. So by using De Morgan's Law, the and becomes an or. And then I complement each of the pieces of that expression, which is O and C. And since they were already complemented, uh, it cancels out. You guys with me? Right? So then this becomes um, O and not C, and O and not O, not o and not C, right? Is that the same thing they got? Yes. Right, so that's the same thing they got. I think the way the book explains it is they just say go to the rows with zero, build up these product of sums. But every time you have a 0 here, that becomes a, a non-complemented literal. You guys with me here? So this is O or C, even though it was 0, 0, right? Likewise, down here, it's 1, 1, 1, but it's not O, not C, right? You guys with me? OK. So those are called max terms. Um, OK, um, we, then you've got these Boolean axi axi axioms, axioms, axioms. So axioms, they say that in Wally? The axiom, that was the name of the ship. Oh, oh OK, OK, yeah. Um, axiom. So we have axioms and we have theorems. Um, the book splits the theorems into single variable theorems, right? And multivariable theorems, which are in this table, right? So we have some examples. So each of these examples, by the way, their goal, so like I said, they start out with product of sums. Oh, sorry, sum of, sum of products. Sum of products. How do we know it's sum of products? Because sum of products, right? Sum of products form. And the goal is, is to transform this expression into an equivalent expression, equivalent in the sense that it would generate the same truth table. It would be true under the same conditions, right? Under the same inputs, right? And only the same inputs, right? But we want to simplify it. That's our goal. We want to simplify. We don't want to do full product of sums because it's overkill. We don't need to do full product of sums. Sorry, I said that wrong again. Sum of products. We don't have to do full sum of products because we can reduce it down into a simpler uh, form. Now, you, you may say, well, define simpler. What do you mean by that? Simpler in the sense, usually, the goal is to make it simpler in the sense that it would require less hardware to build a circuit that does that. You guys with me? So less gates, right? Simpler means less gates. So uh, in this case, the idea is you notice that B 
can be taken out using the distributive property, right? And once you've got B out, you notice, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, A and not A? That's redundant. That's going to be true no matter what. Um, complements, because of complements, it's true, right? So we can just take A and not A out because it's just true, it's equivalent to true. That just leaves us B, so this is equivalent to just B. So that doesn't, re that, that doesn't, re need, that doesn't require any gates at all. Um, this one is, um, this one they give you one that is not originally in sum of products form. This one is in a sort of an arbitrary, not in a, it's not in a canonical form, it's like just an arbitrary expression. Um, but they use a similar trick here. I mean, really, they notice I've got A, B, right? Or A, B, and A, B, C. I could take A, B out. You guys see that, right? Using, again, distributivity. Um, and then what's left in here is 1 or C, which is, which is redundant, because if you, if you have 1 or anything, it's just 1, right? You guys with me? So we can take that out. That's just equivalent to 1. That's because of the null element theorem. And then anything anded with 1, again, that's redundant. Anything anded with 1 is just the original thing that you anded with 1. So we could take that 1 out. And then use associativity to move the parentheses. And A and A is also redundant. That can be you know, just reduced to A. So what we're left with is A and B. Right? Now you might say, what? What's the big deal with that? What, what's so remarkable? What's so special about this? Well, because if you looked at that expression, just looking at that, you would never think that that's equivalent to just A and B, right? I, that looks complicated, right? But there's this sort of built-in redundancy in there where you can reduce, you can simplify the expression without changing its functionality. That's pretty neat. The other thing that's neat about this from a computational point of view is that there's no fast way to do this, by the way. You can't, if you, pro, if you wrote a program that does this, it would be very slow. Right? It's NP complete, meaning that as you add number of variables with these things, it would increase the time it takes a computer to do this this simplification increase the time exponentially with respect to the number of input um, variables, right? This is a classical NP complete problem. So this is something that um, is, is a, it's, it's a difficult problem to solve. All right, where do you talk about De Morgan's theorem? Okay, so let's look at another example. Um, what if my goal is not to reduce to simplify the equation. What if I don't care about simplifying the equation, but I want to apply a constraint to the equation? What happens if I, I need to implement logic in hardware, but I'm limited to logic gates that only have two inputs? Now I mentioned to you guys last time that in a the, the way this works, by the way, just so you know, is that it, when you make a chip, you generally go to the fab. So the company that fabricates the chip, like TSMC or Austria Microsystems or LSI Logic, rest in peace, or any of these companies that make the chips, they usually distribute a, um, a cell library as part of the technology library. You guys with me? So if I want to make a chip, I go to the vendor and I say, all right, I'm going to fab a chip. Um, and they'll give you uh, models, simulation models for the devices. They'll give you design rules that, that discuss you know, how close things can be and the minimal, minim, minimum sizes of features in the design. And usually they'll also give you a standard cell library. Sometimes they outsource that from another company. But they give you this library of gate designs that can be implemented directly in the silicon. And you use that along with a, with a synthesis tool where you take Verilog code, which is like um, 
hardware description language, which we're, we're going to get into in uh, chapter uh, four, I think. And it'll, it'll, it'll compile a, a design into these gates, right? You guys with me? My point is, is that the gate library usually is fairly small. You, you generally only have two and three input gates. That's it. You, you, so the problem is, is that if I want to do something like a full adder, so you guys remember the full adder, right? The full adder had a, uh, an A and a B input, right? And a carry in, right? And it has two outputs. It has a sum, sum, and carry out. Right? So it's like three individual bits that I'm adding together, and I'm producing a result that's two bits. You guys remember this? Yeah. Right? OK, so the sum, what is the sum? The sum is actually the least significant bit of, this, of the sum of the three input bits. So if I have one of these turned on, if A, B, or C is turned on and the others are zero, then my sum is going to be one because it's like saying, well, there's an odd number of one bits coming in, right? Likewise, if all three of them are turned on, I also put a one. You guys remember that, right? So, so how do you build that? Well, you can build it with a XOR gate, right? So sum equals A XOR. It's a plus with a circle around it, right? Yeah, XOR, right? XOR, B, XOR, C, exclusive OR. So this creates a odd parity function, right? Problem is, is that it's really hard to build an XOR gate in CMOS. So you usually don't get one. So if you want to do this, you have to convert this into, you know, ands and ors, right? Actually, nans and nors, but let's just convert it to simplify this. We'll say ands and ors. So this is equivalent to what? Um, a, we'll convert it to min terms, right? So how many min terms are there? Well, how many times is this one? Well, if there's one bit set or if there's three bits set. Well, there's three ways I can set one bit. It can be A, B, or C. So, you know, it's a, say A is one, B and C are zero, right? Or A is, B is one and A and C are zero, right? Or C is 1 and A and B are 0, right? Those are my three min terms. And then there's a fourth min term because A, B, and C can all be 1. So I've got four min terms, and there's four rows of the truth table where this expression would be 1, right? <clears throat> now, the problem is, is that this is complicated because it requires me to have three inputs and gates. Right? Because I've got to put these three literals into a gate. And it requires a four input OR gate, which is a problem, right? I might not have that four input OR gate. So I might want to apply these Boolean law, these Boolean theorems to give me a, not necessarily a minimal number of gates, but something that I could do in um, smaller gates in, in terms of number of inputs, right? Yeah, sim yeah, right. Yeah, simplify in, in, the, in, the, in the case of how many inputs I've got. So how can I do that? Uh, let me erase this. Can you guys over there see this? OK, good. This chalk is kind of light. Um, a, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C. All right. All right, so um, so can I, you know, generally speaking, you, you start out with a distribu distributivity, dis distribu distributive, distributive law, right? Is there any commonality to these guys? Um, well, I've got an A. You can separate them into a couple of groups. Yeah, how about this one? I'll take A out of this one. So this is not B, not C, or B and C. Right? So I could take this min term and this min term, and I can take the, I can distribute the A, right? And then the B and C, not B, not C, and not C, or B and C. And then you could also right? do that with not A. Right, so I can take not A, yep, and that would be B, not C, or like that, right? <laughs> Yeah, 
you know. Okay, well check this out. You can also do the, distribu the distributivity like this as well. Let's leave this guy alone for now. This is kind of something that you might not think of. Um, this guy, you can say not A. Okay, this, these things here, what if we added B and not C or B and C, right? That's what I had before. I didn't change anything yet. But what happens if I do this too? Um, A, not A, B, not B. Now, can I do that? Well, not A, not A is 0, right? And B and not B is 0. But that's OK because I'm just, yeah, I'm just doing ORs. I'm ORing the zeros, and ORing zeros is OK, right? Well, no, these guys are guaranteed. These both, these both, these both term. Uh, sorry. I'm talking about B and C and not B, not C in the second equation. This one? Yes. Yeah, I mean, there there could be cases where one one side of this or the other side are they're not they could be ex mutually exclusive, right? It could be when this when this part is true, this part may not be true, right? OK, so but why would I do that? Why would I? Um, well, um, it turns out this, this thing. I'm, I'm still kind of yeah. how do you expand with the A, A not, B, B not? I just added two redundant terms. Just to kind of, well, how come? Oh, I was about to get to that. Okay. Yeah, the, 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 I can do it. The question is, why did I do it? I did it because. You can apply, you can take this and you can convert it into, you can use the distributive law again, except you can do one of these numbers. You can say, um, you can say A or, let's see, A or not B and not A or B. So check this out. If I take A, if, think of this like just regular algebra, right? If I take A, if I have this expression, I take A and not A, that gives me this guy, or A and B, oh, I screwed that up. Hold on a minute. So it's A, I think I might have did it, it should be this way. So it's A and not A, right? And then A or, wait, I've got B and C. Oh, I screwed, oh, it's, oh, sorry, it's not A and B, it's B and C, that's why I'm confused, sorry. B and C are my two terms in here. I don't have A, sorry. Okay, sorry. Um, so let's see, is it this way? B and not B is that guy. B and not C is that guy. I also screwed this part up too. I meant to put, yeah, sorry. I, I was thinking A and B at this part too. Let me fix that. This is um, B, C, yeah, so there we go. There we go. Yeah, so the A should be um, B here. Yeah, B and not C, sorry, screw that up again. B and not B plus C or not C. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> All right, sorry. All right, so if I have this expression, then I can reduce this to, uh, let's see, B and B or C. So if, if I have B, B and not B gives me this one. B and not C gives me this one. Not B and C gives me this one. And C and not C gives me that one. There we go. That's the way it works out. You see that? Yes. Yep. Could it not, okay, I'm just, could it not just work, could you not do that RSL without adding the other last two? Like the B, B not, B, C not? I'm sorry? 
Could I have not done it without this? Yeah. Uh, it was like you just kind of like added another, like the same thing twice, but you didn't really need to. Um, I don't know. How did I work this out before? Um, possibly. The reason I was, the, the reason, uh, the reason I did this was because we want to try to find a, um, a, um, we're trying to find a common sub-expression, right? So if I were to then, if I were to then invert this, right, twice, Right? Okay. I can do that. If I do that, I can use the Morgan's law here. Right? And this becomes not B, C, or uh, B, C. So this, so we, we're going to take, we're going to use the Morgan's law, so this sum would become, uh, uh, sorry, this, this product, these, these two sub-expressions product would become a sum. And then we would, we would invert these individual guys. So this would be um, B, this B and C would be not B, not C, or B and C. You see that? B or C, you, so you're saying, does it come back to this point? No, I mean like down no it's, it's a little different. No, it's I mean like down there when you said you're going to knot it twice, it's just going to be the same. Point. Right, yeah, that's right. But the, the point is, is that now I've got, um, check this out, I've got this, this sub-expression here matches this sub-expression. Okay. Right, that's, makes sense? So, so I can, I can, I can build a circuit that performs this sub-expression. I'm looking for some room to do that here. Uh, so you know, let me do it over here. So um, not B, not C, right? Those are anded, and B and C are anded. And those are ORD. You see that? Make sense? Does that match? OK. Then um, I also have, so I take the, that and I AND it with A, right? So I can put A. I want to try to make this a little cleaner. I could take A and AND those like that, right? So that gives me this part. And then this part, I can have not A. Well, first of all, I can take this guy, and I can fan that out. Now, this is the key, because remember over here, I had to, I had to do this double inversion. So this, this bottom inversion, complement inversion, <coughs> this bottom inversion, I, I, used, I absorbed into De Morgan's law, but I had to keep this top one there, right? So in the circuit design, I can implement that by taking that sub-expression and bringing it into an inverter, right? Like that. And then I can take not A, and I can put those together, and then OR the whole thing. Like that. Guys with me? So it looks, what is it now? It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven logic gates. Originally, it would have taken one, two, three, four, five. 
it would have taken one AND gate for each of the for each of the min terms, right? And one OR gate to sum all the min terms up. Right? But these logic gates have more inputs, right? So if you count inputs, 3, 3, 3, and 3, that's 12 inputs plus 4 for the OR gate, right? So that would be 16 inputs. Whereas over here, how many do I have? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 inputs. So more inputs, but the biggest gate I've got has two inputs. Yeah, these, these guys are knotted. Yeah, but this demonstrates that I can reuse. The point of this is that I was able to reuse this. I calculated this sub-expression, and I was able to reuse it. Of course, I didn't directly reuse it. Well, I kind of reused it. I fanned off that. I brought it into an inverter, right? Um, and so I've got smaller gates, but they do the same thing. So in this case, I've got more inputs and more gates, but if I only have two input gates, this is the way to do it, or one way to do it. You guys with me? Also, this is a slower circuit, uh, because notice that when you do, well, possibly slower in terms of gate delays. If you, do, if you do this in Boolean logic, this would only go through two gates. Every input would go through an AND gate and then an OR gate to the output, whereas over here, I have like this not B goes through an AND gate, an OR gate, an inverter, an AND gate, and then an OR gate. So this one has a longer critical path. You guys see that? Of course, it's, you're doing it with smaller gates, so the gates themselves would be faster. So unclear which one would actually be a slower, the faster circuit. But this one is constrained to have two input gates. Probably I could have done it. I could have also just taken this guy and converted these three input gates to two input gates by cascading them together. Might have worked too. But um, like, because you could take, if you have A, not B, not C, that's what this is, right? But I could have also said A, not B, not C. I could have done that too, right? I could have cascaded those three inputs into two cascaded AND gates, right? Because of associativity. That's the associativity theorem. Yes? Oh yeah, yeah, the not C you can you can potentially find reuse in here as well. But yeah, in this case in this case I was I put all the literals, you know, just up here. Um, in fact, well no, I guess I just have one. I have A, B, and C. Oh, and then I've got yeah, not A, not B, not C. Yeah, I've got every version. Um, So that's kind of like the book shows. Um, this is a picture of a PLA. You guys cover PLAs, programmable logic arrays. So this is a way to formalize. If you have a circuit like this, instead of drawing it like this, you can draw it like this, where you have your inputs coming in, vertical wires, and each input has a complemented form, right? Also vertical wired, connected to a vertical wire. And then the AND gates, um, you can connect each one of these to AND gates by connecting each AND gate to a specific literal, literal specific wire. Yeah, and then the AND gates then would come out and all would be connected to the, and the OR gate here. This would implement the sort of the product of sums notation. A PLA, a programmable logic device, is a device where you have this structure set up and you can electronically connect, you can form connections uh, from each one of these input variables or its complement to an AND gate, right? 
You guys with me? So you can make connections here, right? And then likewise, you can connect um, outputs here to, you know, there's usually more than one OR gate, but in this case, there's only one OR gate. So it's like, well, you know, obviously they're all, they can all be connected, but you can have different OR gates. And then by forming connections here and here, you can create an arbitrary circuit. Yes? I have no idea what was <laughs> you went you uh I think I've got it written down here. The final the final version was um, a okay or not a B, well, not B, not B, not, not B, not C, plus B, C, but then that was inverted, right? So this, this is a, um, you could replace this with a, uh, a sub-expression. Like you could assign an intermediate variable to this, like S or something, or temp, right? So this, so temp would be this expression, not B and not C, or B and C. And so this would then be A and temp, or not A and not temp, right, is the idea. So we wanted to get this common sub-expression that we could, you know, leverage for the hardware. Yeah, no, this would, yeah, this would be inverted. Okay, any questions about that? All right. Um, so the book has this, this, um, this part on uh, bubble pushing, the idea being that um, I mentioned that uh, real CMOS gates are all, you know, NANs and NORs, right? Why? Because... You know, because the, the NMOSs are the pull down, and you, you have to, to do it. In order to build a CMOS gate for a truth table, every row that has a zero output has to have at least one true. You guys with me? In order to create the pull down, the, the NMOS pull down network. So if you have a design that's already in negative logic gates, right? How do you convert it into a form that's not negative logic gates, right? You can use this bubble pushing idea, which just performs De Morgan's theorem. So in other words, if you have an AND gate, that's equivalent to an, a regular OR gate where you invert the inputs, right? You guys follow that? So if you have a circuit like this, and you want to convert it to ANDs and ORs, you can start at the output and take the bubble, this bubble at the, at the output of the NAND gate, and you can push it backwards. Make sense? So you take this AND gate, you push the bubble back to the inputs, and it becomes, a, a, it becomes a, an OR with inverted inputs, right? But then you, you realize, oh, wait a second. I've got a bubble here on this input and a bubble on this output, so those guys cancel each other out. Show that? No, it doesn't show that. But yeah, yeah, these guys, these guys cancel each other out. You guys with me? So what does that mean? Well, that actually has implications. That means that any any um, product of sums circuit can be product of sums is when you have a, a a layer of AND gates you go through and then an OR gate, right? Well, you can replace all those with just AND gates. You guys with me? You can just do this. this. This is a product of sums circuit, right? Um, but what if you have something more complicated that doesn't, that doesn't fit, it's not product of sums, something like this. Well, then it's a little bit less straightforward, uh, but you can still do it. You push those bubbles back, and then oh, these guys cancel out. And then this guy pushes back. 
So what you end up with is, <clears throat> in one case, you've got an intermediate wire that's just canceled out. You can take the bubbles off of it completely. And then in other cases, you've got values that come in to bubbles, in which case you can just replace the input with its, with its complemented literal. You guys with me? So what is the point of this? Well, it just you can take a, a gate, a, 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 a circuit with CMOS gates, and you can transform it into just NAN, regular ANDs and OR gates. Can you go the other way? Mm, probably. The book doesn't talk about that, though. <laughs> they talk about going CMOS gates back to regular gates. All right. Um, OK, good. Well, that's all we got for today. Um,